I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for loving me. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for loving me. Just as I am in the good and the bad, you still understand. sun comes up, there when it goes away, you're the closest one, when I'm in the furthest place, there when I look to you, there when I run away, if there was a day that came after the Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Welcome to a study in a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church on the western coast of what we call Turkey in the first century. Each week during our study of Ephesians, from now all the way through July 4, we're going to choose a verse of the week. You'll see it on the screen, you'll read it in your bulletin, you'll hear about it during the sermon. And some of you will even want to join us in memorizing the verse of the week. Whether you do or not, this verse is a wonderful introduction to this book because it shows us a way that Ephesians is unique among all of Paul's letters. In most of his letters, after a brief greeting, he thanks God for them. In only two of his letters does he start with the word praise, 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. And the reason Ephesians is unique is because Paul, after that one word, praise, goes on for 200 words in the Greek original without a period. This is one long, run-on sentence. He's so full of praise to God. So this is a great verse for you to hear right at the beginning of the study. And if you want, join us in committing it to memory. Why don't we read it off the screen now together? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I said this in uh, the 830 service, but they didn't get it. So let's see if y'all get it. There's another reason that it's great that 2 Corinthians starts out with praise, because if you read 1 Corinthians, you'd be a little sad. I was reading in Isaiah last night. And Isaiah chapter 1 says, listen, come on now. He's talking to Israel. He says, let's argue it out. No matter how deep your sins are, I can cleanse you just like new fallen snow. And uh, there's a song that was written that says, however deep the depths of our sin, the grace of Christ is deeper still. However great the battle that you have within, the love of Christ is greater still. And so this morning we come to a God that is in the business of giving out every spiritual blessing. And so he says, through Paul to the Ephesians, through Jesus Christ, God our Father has given you every blessing in the heavenly realms. And it belongs to us because of what Christ did on the cross. So I'm going to say this one more time in the sermon. But this is the difference between being given the cold cup of water when you are dying of thirst and being given the entire fountain. And so we've not only been given just grace, we've been given the source of grace. Those who are in Christ belong to him. And he's going to say later on, he has marked you as his own by giving you the, the 
truth of the inheritance, which is the Holy Spirit. So we have so much to praise the Lord for and be thankful for this morning. So let's do this real quickly. To Shabbat the Lord, say Shabbat. Shabbat the Lord is to shout to the Lord. Now, Pentecostals do this better than we do. So we'll just, we'll just accept that, but we'll, we'll try to grow in that. Um, to Barak the Lord, say Barak. Barak the Lord is to worship the Lord and praise the Lord with our posture. Have you ever thought why you stand? It's the same reason why all those British people stand when Queen Elizabeth walks in the room. It's, just, it's, a, it's a way of recognizing. So we stand, we, we clap, you know. That's a way of recognizing through our posture what we do. We gill before the Lord, say gill. Gill is the Hebrew word for to dance before the Lord. You know, so we don't dance very well either. That We can change that this morning. Uh, but that's what David does when he's coming before the Ark of the Covenant being brought back into Israel and he dances before the Lord. And guess what? His wife makes fun of him. Some things never change. Um, and she's like, he's like, it doesn't matter. Dancing wasn't for you. It was for the Lord. And I'm even to look like, I'm willing to look like more of a fool just for his sake and his honor. And then finally, yada, say yada. Yada is to worship the Lord lifted hands. That is a biblical term. That's not something that the Pentecostals came up with and they were like, well, I just feel like putting my hands in my pockets and someone's like, no, you should raise them. Show them that you haven't shaved your underarms. Anyway, so, but we worship the Lord with lifted hands and it's a posture of surrender for one, but it's also a posture of the same thing when you ever have a little baby and, and they don't know what to say. They just cry to you and raise their hands. It's this posture of surrender. It's this posture of saying, it's about you and not about me. So let's pray and let's do all these things as we worship the Lord. Jesus, thank you so much for being the author and perfecter of our faith. Thank you, God, that you are the fount of mercy, the fount of grace. And Lord God, we long to honor you in all that we do. So Lord, be lifted high in this place. Let us fulfill the purpose for which we were created for, which was to glorify you, honor you, because we belong to you. And it's in your incredible name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing. May fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. Well, there's hope in my heart.
song is like this. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. times his praise will always be on my lips i will glorify i will glory in the lord let the afflicted hear and rejoice glorify the lord with me let us exalt his name together i sought the lord and he answered me he delivered me from all my fears those who look to him are radiant their faces are never covered with shame this poor man called and the lord heard him he saved me out of my troubles the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Will you pray with me? 
Jesus, some days praise is easy, some days praise is hard. But you have heard our prayers. And for the places where we have experienced deliverance, we praise you. And the places we're still waiting, we praise you. We love you. Help us trust you. Amen. a moment when the sky lit up A flash of light was breaking through When all was lost he crossed eternity The king of life was on the move For in a dark cold tomb where our Lord was laid What miraculous breath And we're forever changed How oh, hail King Jesus How oh,
Lord God, we call for the open skies. Lord God, just that you would rain down upon us. And Jesus, we need you. We stand before you parched and weary. We stand before you completely under the weight of our own sin, the things that we have done and not done, said and unsaid. And Lord Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness. We know, Lord God, that you are the fountain of grace and mercy. And so, Lord God, let us come to you boldly because of what you have done, Jesus Christ. Lord God, receive these praises, Lord God, because you are more than worthy. Everything we could possibly ever need, want, want to know, understand is found in you, Lord God. Lord God, for the places, places in our lives where we are just broken, Lord, we come to you for healing. Lord God, for the hearts that need mending and healing, we pray for your supernatural healing, for the bodies that need healing. We lift up our brother Rob Collins to you this morning and just ask that your hand would be upon him, completely healing him. And Lord God, we lift up those who are struggling with injury, those who are struggling with cancer, those who are struggling with COVID, all of it. And we ask for your hand to be upon them. Lord God, as we take up this offering, Lord, we receive it, hopefully, you receive it in the message that we want to give, which is we give it back to you joyfully, God. You have given us so much. And so, Jesus, be lifted high in this place today. May your Holy Spirit move and have his way. And it's in your awesome name we pray, Lord. Amen. You may come forward and bring your tithes and offerings whenever you're ready. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody says they start picking people at your two captains and maybe you get picked last or near last and you keep thinking, oh, I really hope they pick me. I want to be on the team. Yeah. That's happened to you before? Mm-mm, not in tennis. Not in tennis? Well, how would you feel if you got picked last or you were worried that you might not get chosen? Like sad. Like you don't want to be on the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You feel a little sad, sad and nervous? Yeah. But there's good news that God has for us. He tells us that he has chosen us. He chose us to be a part of his family before we were even born. Mm -hmm. He had a plan for us. And he has adopted us into his family. And do you know what adopted means, Emmy? It means like you adopt an animal or something. You can adopt an animal. It means like you like get it or like buy it to make it have your home or like you live with it right you welcome you adopt somebody into your home into your family Mm -hmm. into your heart right yep okay so now you know that god has already adopted you into his family like we adopted java and Hawkeye. we adopted our animals into our house and we give them a pretty good life don't we Mm -hmm. what is one thing you have to do that that god says to please do to be adopted into his like family. love him and believe in him, maybe? Love him and believe in him. Trust that Jesus died on the cross for you so that you could live in heaven forever with him. So he's given us love and he's given us eternal life in heaven with him. And all we have to do is believe and trust in him. Do you think we can do that? Yeah. And do you guys feel special that you were chosen by God? Yeah. That's pretty amazing, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's say a little prayer and thank God for choosing us. Okay. Dear Lord, we just thank you for choosing us, adopting us into your family. We trust in you, we believe in you, and we love you, Lord. 
stay in our hearts and help us to be good kids, good people that follow you and trust in you. And thank you again for choosing us. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Bye. 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 All right, welcome. Um, it's so great to see everybody here and, and back in seats and normal seats. And I don't know about you, but my cushion is so much more comfortable than it used to be. So I don't know if we got new chairs. Are they new? New chairs. Yay! Yay! They're so nice. All right, so those that are online, um, you can also get the bulletin and also kid sheets at corntoday.org forward slash now. Um, and then if you're in person, the black pads are back. So please pick the black pad up at the end of the aisle, fill it out, and pass it down the row. Um, that is just one more step to being open, so excellent. Um, Corinth partners with uh, a high school here in town called HCAM, which is Hickory um, Career Arts Magnet, I believe, HCAM. Wednesday at 6 p.m. in Boston, join us for worship and a time of prayer for those students. Uh, we also need $10 gift cards and people to write cards of encouragement for those students. So all high schools in Hickory support, are supported by a church, um, and HCAM was not, and so Corinth partnered with them. And then uh, my final one is COVID Vaccine Clinic. Uh, we'll be hosting one here in Boston on Thursday from 12 to 8 p.m. Uh, more information is at corinthtoday.org forward slash vaccine. Uh, we created this as a community event, um, but anyone 16 and over is welcome. So spread the word. Um, I know those are you know sought after and people are after them. So moms of all ages are invited to come back here for the very last Refresh for Moms. This Well, the last Refresh for Moms for the school year. Um, it's going to be this Tuesday night at 6.30. It's a place to come and be encouraged and equipped and belong with other moms. Our speakers will be Sandy Schrantz and Mary Filkins. We'll together be sharing about how to grow and survive through brokenness. So we would love to see all the mamas here on Tuesday night at 6.30. Then we have two more babies after the pandemic. Baby. Paul, we're going to need to set up more time to announce all the babies out of the COVID baby boom. COVID baby boom. Uh, so the two precious new babies that we get to uh, invite into our church family are Eva Claire Payne, born to Adam and Sarah Payne, and then Anna Sophia, Anna Sophie Perez, born, born to Callie and Irvin. And that's always exciting to add new babies Absolutely. to our congregation. <laughs> At this time, our elder Bill will pray for Paul before he gives us the, today's message. Father God, it gives me great pleasure to lift Paul up to you before he preaches today. We ask, Father, that you would give him clarity of mind and peace about what he's doing today, that he might be able to declare and proclaim that you are God and that you love us and that you take care of us. I pray that you'll bless Paul as he delivers his message today. Bless him spiritually, physically. I pray that you'll bless his family and his many ministries. I pray especially for his sermon today. We love you and praise you and lift him up in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me say a little bit more about the HCAM thing that's going on. Um, that's Boss, if you didn't know, is this room right here. So uh, it'll be set up just like this. And so this Wednesday night, um, you'll be in here, the youth will be in here. Uh, please come back, 6 to 7. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some time. Uh, we're going to pray. We're going to praise. And then I will give you just a short devotion about evangelism through writing. Because guess what Ephesians is? Evangelism is what Philippians is. Guess what all the Gospels were? So we're going to take time during that night to write to 230 of those students. Now, as you can tell, if this group right here, if everyone came, we'd have no problem. We'd, we'd knock it out. Um, so but what we're going to do is we're going to write a personal note to each one of those. It doesn't necessarily have to be their name, but we're going to personally just share some, some Christ-centered encouragement with them. And then hopefully our church is going to collect enough $10 gift cards to whatever, you know, teenage-friendly restaurant is. Please don't give them, like, you know, $10 to, you know, Talbots or something. Probably not going to go very well or go very far either. Um, but, you know, $10 gift cards, and then we'll just take all of those, and it kind of is an end of the year, like, we care about you. 
we care about you. And, you know, some people, they, they, they hear you say Jesus loves us, and sometimes they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes they will hear Jesus loves you better when they see that you actually love them too. Um, so this is a tangible thing that we want to do. So Wednesday night, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and we'll be done. And uh, the youth will have some food. If you're not a youth, eat before or after. Sorry. Perks of being old or not old. So turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to begin this series in the book of Ephesians, as Bob showed you at the intro video, unless you came in late. Um, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians, and there's going to be just kind of a soft um, encouragement to do some scripture memory. So this week's verse is Ephesians 1, 3, um, which is right there, how we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with, sorry, <laughs> I skipped ahead. Let's, go, let's start at the beginning. Uh, then we'll get to verse 3 then. This letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. It is written to God's holy people in Ephesus, who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be yours, sent to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing, him, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he has poured out on us because we belong to his dearly beloved son. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of Christ and our sins are forgiven. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us from the beginning, and all things happen just as he decided long ago. God's purpose was that we who were the first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. And now you... I've also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us everything that he's promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. This is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. So we're going to be in Ephesians for a while, um, be in Ephesians, and we're going to break some of this stuff down. Usually I teach, if this is your first or second time, usually I teach a verse-by-verse verse exposition. Um, there's, we, could, I, we could go verse-by-verse, verse and I could maybe get through five in an hour. Uh, this is so rich and so thick and so incredible. So rather than do that, we're going to take it, and I'm going to kind of give you an overview, and then I'm going to kind of give you three three of the main points that he's doing and work the verses into that. Now, writing letters was something that y'all typically don't do too much of anymore. And so I want to take you back to a summer, and this is summer of 1994, and Danielle and I are not even engaged yet. We would get engaged that fall, but we wrote letters to one another. We wrote letters to one another. She was working for an HMO called Kaiser Permanente, and I was working for a camp. And guess which one of us made money? Not me. So she, in one of the letters that she wrote me, she said, I can't wait for the time that we're going to be like peas and carrots again. Now, if you're a Gen Xer, you probably immediately recognize that illusion. If you're not, you're like, is there some romantic thing about old people when they compare themselves to vegetables? I don't understand. So the illusion is from a movie called Forrest Gump where Forrest is a little bit slow and his love of his life is a girl named Jenny. And so he talks about this time where Jenny comes and we won't talk about the things that they do, which is kind of scary. But anyway, she comes to his house and it says, and Jenny and I was just like peas and carrots, which if you've noticed in a can, peas and carrots come together. So Danielle was making this illusion and it was this kind of inside story and she shared it with me and I'll always remember it because it meant something to me. We loved that movie. We loved Forrest and Jenny. Well, I was running. All those kind of things, you know. So we love that. And so when we write letters to each other, what are the things we include? Now we include personal things that only the other person's going to get. These inside stories, these inside jokes. Uh, we also tell each other new things. We share news with one another. Uh, we tell each other things that we know already. You know, couples, I'm going to share something with you. Husbands, by the way, husbands. 
You may have told your wife you loved her on the day of your wedding. Guess what? That wasn't enough. She would like to hear it again and again and again and again. She knows it. She would like to hear it. So that's what we do in a letter. We tell each other things that we already know. And then also, certainly, we remind and reiterate things that are important. We remind and reiterate things that are important. And so, you know, I, I would look at Nick, and if I was writing Nick a letter, you know, I'd write Nick a letter because Nick's now part of the Tar Heel family. He's been accepted. He's in the master's degree program at Carolina. If you're a Duke fan, there's the door. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We love you. We love you too. But, um, but you know, so, so if I, in a letter, I can write to Nick, hey, good job, Tar Heel. He knows he's a Tar Heel, but I'm going to write that anyway, and I'm going to remind and reiterate things that are important. And so when Paul is writing, he's going to do all these same things. Tell them things they already know, share news, share personal things with them, reiterate and remind things that are important. But before we do any more just on the letter, let's talk about Paul's relationship with the people at Ephesus. Paul spends almost three years in Ephesus. He spends almost three years in Ephesus. If you want to see the historical context of this, go back and look at Acts chapter 19, because Acts chapter 19 is the account of Paul's third missionary journey where he spends almost three years in Ephesus. Incredible things happen during that time. While he's there, um, he's there after another evangelist named Apollos has come through. Now, Apollos was a powerful evangelist and a speaker and some people came to faith in jesus christ and it was a small number of people and so the seeds that apollos had sown paul comes in and begins to disciple and begins to work with and spends three years and it says that he went every day and taught in the synagogue there taught worked with the jewish believers worked with the pagan believers or, or the pagans worked with the gentiles worked with all of them and shared the gospel and god actually while he was there in ephesus enabled paul to perform miracles Paul could heal people. Paul could drive demons out of people. So much so that, you know, people would line up in places they thought he would walk and see if their Paul's shadow would fall over them or if a handkerchief that touched him or whatever. They had all these beliefs. One of the best stories in the Bible, and for me, and this would be the funniest story in the Bible, is in Acts chapter 19. And it's about these miracles that Paul would do. Paul's performing these miracles. So there were these guys, the seven sons of a man named Siva, who saw Paul doing these miracles. And so they were like, Bing, light bulb. And so they started going out and they were trying to go up to people and they say, we command you to be well in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Or we go to a demonic person, they would say, we command you to be cleansed in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. They didn't know Jesus. They just heard of Paul. They kind of co-opted it. They thought that was really cool one day until they went up to a demonic guy. This is the best story ever. They went up to a demonic guy and they were like, we command you demons in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. We don't really know him. It's like he's a cousin of a cousin of a cousin of a friend of mine who Paul preaches. Come out. The demon responds back to them. This is great. I know Paul. I know Jesus. I don't know who y'all are. Then proceeds to jump on the seven guys. This is seven on one. I mean, this is like Jean-Claude Van Damme, but demonic. And beats the other seven men naked. Now, hang on just a second. He is not naked himself and beats them up. He beats them up so bad that they leave the fight naked. That's a beatdown. Amazing story in Acts chapter 19. So God does amazing things through Paul while he's there. And so one of the other things that we'll see in Acts chapter 19 is that people who are very far away begin to submit and surrender to Christ and become believers. It says also in the chapter that many who practiced dark arts and sorcery came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, taking their black magic books and burning them in a testimonial. And the cost of the books was totaled at millions of dollars. It'll say that right there for you as you read Acts chapter 19. So much so was this preaching powerful that in Ephesus, the goddess of the town was the goddess Artemis. And she had a great temple, she, <laughs> the idol had a great temple and it was big and beautiful and people would come around to see the temple of Artemis. And there was a big trade there because, you know, false things also can create economies. And part of the economy was people that would come together in an artisanal way and cast idols of the goddess, the deity Artemis. And they began to get so frustrated because people were leaving the faith of idolatry and coming to true faith in Christ. And so several of them went out in the streets and began a riot to have Paul thrown away, thrown out or killed. Cooler heads prevailed, but the church said, all right, Paul, maybe it's time for you to go. Paul later, as he is on his final journey of his life on the way back to Jerusalem, decides, hey, I don't want to stop in Asia. By the way, Ephesus is what is in modern day Turkey. So on the way, he stops at another port town called Miletus, which is about 40 miles south of Ephesus. 
And the church of Ephesus, the elders, love him so much they travel that journey and meet with him. And then for the rest of the journey, he leaves there on his way to Jerusalem. Of course, there's a shipwreck and things like that that, that, that happen. But he's then arrested, thrown in jail, chained 24 hours a day to a Roman centurion. And from those chains, he pens this letter to the church at Ephesus. So I ask you this question. What would you write people that you had spent three years of your life with? That is twice as long as the average youth pastor stays at a church. That's how he spent three years there with the church at Ephesus. Many of it not great. Like I don't think when riots are started about you, not necessarily things that you're excited about. But what would you say? Let's get into the historical headspace of Ephesus before we do anything else because I think there's a lot of things that we need to come back and go oh hold on I kind of took that for granted that this or I took that for granted that or I forgot that this might be this way so let's come back and let's just get a sense of what the church at Ephesus is like every person at the church in Ephesus is a new believer think about this the oldest Christian in the town has been a Christian for three years or less think about how you were as a new Christian what are some of the things that you believed I used to believe that Christ was kind of like the force. And if I concentrated on things hard enough, they would begin to float. When I was a young Christian. Some of that is I like Star Wars. But also, too, think about the amount of turnover there is in a new church. Paul, Jesus says this in the, in, the, in the parable of the sower. Some of the seed sprouts up, yeah, 30, 60, 90, 100 fold. Some of it's choked out by the weeds of life. Some of it's snatched up by the evil one. Same thing is going to be happening in the church of Ephesus. Here's a huge one. The church at Ephesus has no Bible. Think about, when we think about going to share the gospel or, or going to another country or going to a set of people that don't know about Jesus, what's the first thing we say? Well, we've got to take a bunch of Bibles around. Number one, there is no New Testament. This is the New Testament. We're reading it today. Ephesians became part of it. There's no New Testament. There's no Gospels. There's no Old Testament for them. How rare a copy of the Torah would have been? They didn't have that. Had none of it. All they have is the oral tradition of what Paul, and you can see now, drilling into them day after day for three years. Drilling it into them. And so it was so important for Paul to have known all about Abraham, Moses, Noah, Isaac, Samuel. All poured into them and then connected to Christ and give it to them, give it to them. But they don't have it in writing. Also, too, they have no professional staff. It's not like the church at Ephesus was like, hey, listen, we need a college minister. You know, the university is pumping out some good people. They have no professional staff. This is just, just people who are elders. They're surrounded by pagan idolatry on every side, susceptible to false teachings. Think about how easy it would be for someone to say, hey, Jesus died on the cross, and if you work really hard, he'll give you salvation. Hey, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. It was all kind of a... But if you really believe in him, maybe. And false teaching, and that's, that's why the whole book of Jude is about false teaching. That, that's why Paul's going to go into it as well when he's going to talk about to the Thessalonians and to Timothy, beware of this false teaching. And so who would you write? What would you write a letter that you'd spent with someone for three years? What would you include in that letter? There's much to be said. But just like those letters that Danielle and I would write, he's going to include personal things. He's going to include inside stories. He's going to tell them things that they already know, but he's going to reiterate and remind them things that they have to come back to and cannot stray from, that they must base and have a bedrock on what they believe. And then finally, if you didn't miss, if you miss it in these first 14 verses, he says Jesus 14 times. So if you've ever wanted to understand how central Jesus is, it's not just he's central, he's all of it. And so what are, what are you know, I'm a... I've got to break it down to places where it's not just, okay, what about the church of Ephesus, but what about us? The same things that he's sharing with the church at Ephesus are true for us today. And so I'm going to give you a couple. And they're basic. And, and, they're, and they're foundational. But we have to kind of stick with them and stay with them. And so he's going to remind them and reiterate three special big things in this. Now there's more, but if we condense it because we're not going verse by verse, we pull them all together. Number one is he says, listen... Dear Ephesus, remember who God in Christ is. Second thing, remember, dear Ephesus, who you are in Christ. And thirdly, remember, Ephesus, God has a purpose and a plan. 
Who is God in Christ? Who are you in God in Christ? And God has a plan and a purpose. So the first one is this. Dear Ephesus, remember who God in Christ is. Remember that in Christ, you have truly been given the divine giver himself. He is the giver of every blessing. And so that's where we get back to verse number three. And he says, how we praise God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Now, if you take that and you apply it to where the Ephesians are, consider what we talked about in the riot in Ephesus. Why would you have to buy idols of Artemis? Why would you have to worship her? Why would you have to show up? Why would you have to participate? Because if you don't do those things, you won't gain the approval of the deity. And Paul starts right off by saying, you need to understand who God is. God, or, God is not the one whom you earn favor for, from. He is the giver of every divine blessing. He's the giver of every divine blessing. And so Paul is also going to say this too. He's not just the giver of every divine blessing. He gives you, in Christ, the source. So again, to come back to this analogy we said at the beginning, it's the difference between being absolutely parched and having someone give you a cold cup of water and being absolutely parched about to die and someone giving you the fountain, someone giving you the well, someone giving you the waterfall, and you get the source. And so he's saying, you kind of don't get how wealthy you are. If you want to look at an incredible commentary on this one, I would highly recommend a guy named Warren Wiersbe if you like to read commentaries. But Warren Wiersbe's commentary about Ephesians is titled, Be Rich. Be rich. He, because they are. They're so rich, not because of the blessings they have in Christ. That's part of it. But they get Christ. They get Christ. There have been several times in my life where someone that had expertise we were in trouble it could have been car problems it could have been fishing issues it could have been you know issues we had hunting it could have been issues some other way and we go and we go and we ask someone what can we do what do we do how do we do can you fix this whatever like that and they don't just fix it they say hey you know what i'm gonna go with you and there's a whole different you know feeling when the person's like hey i'm gonna give you me isn't that what a wedding is like i'm not just gonna give you these things that i think about you and tell you I'm actually going to give you me. And so he's saying to them, listen, do you know who God in Christ is? He is a giver of blessings. And do you know who the recipient of it is? You. You are the, you are the getter. You get it all. And so all through verses 1 through 14, Paul reiterates about the kindness and the mercy that we get from God. Now, why is that important for us to stop and grab a hold of that just for a minute? Now, the Ephesians did not grow up with an adjective for grace that goes along with it but if i were to ask you what's the most well-known hymn in all of christendom in america you would say what amazing grace you know those two words right there together and we ought to be careful because we we are greatly tempted to think yeah god gives grace that's what he does that's who he is yeah that's what god does he's just doing god and forget how amazing and radical it is that we get given grace when we deserve punishment and death. And so for the Ephesians, he's saying to them, you know what you were like. He's going to say this too in, in, in chapter 2. You know what you were like. You can't take credit for it. It's God's grace. And we go, yeah, yeah, it's God's grace. I know, that's what he is. And Paul would say, hang on. Do you realize what you were given? Do you realize what you were given? And so part of it is, I, 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 there's a little bit of Jesse Jackson in me, I apologize. But I want to say this, you and I get amazing grace because of the amazing cost paid on the amazing cross. You and I get amazing grace because of the amazing cost that was paid at the amazing cross. And so part of it is, like, it's not just that we get grace, we got grace at the cost of God's Son. And did he let us borrow him? No, he gave them to us. Literally, Christ laid out in front of all humanity, and all humanity said, uh, and we got the justification that Christ paid for us. And Paul's going to talk about this in Romans chapter 5, not when we did it to deserve it, but when we were dead in our sins. And so hopefully you're in Ephesians, you're, you're, in a, you're an Ephesian going, I'm rich. 
everything that God gave to Christ now belongs to me because he's not just given me the gift, he's given me the son. The only thing I can compare this to, and this is a weak comparison, was that when Danielle and I got married, of course, on a Saturday, and our flight to go out to our honeymoon didn't come until the next um, Sunday evening. I don't know why, Sunday afternoon we flew out. So we had this like awkward period of time uh, that we didn't have anything to do on Sunday. And so my dad was like, well, you should come over and open your wedding presents. That was amazing. Now, we didn't get anything that I wanted. It's all for women. Well, let's, let's talk about this just for a second. Listen, guns, knives, chainsaws, guitars, bikes, all that is good. Like, work that into the next thing you get. But anyway, so it's a bunch of plates anyway. So, but we walk into our den, and I don't know if you remember this, but like there is a pile of presents as big as Mount Everest, and I literally got tired of unwrapping things. I need to take a break from unwrapping presents and we're like oh you didn't even make a dent in it there's more oh my gosh how many discounts is what we need but it's just more and there's more and there's more and paul is saying to them do you realize what you've been given in christ everything every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is yours and so why would he include this because we're such comparators comparison people we love to compare well, he's got this, I don't got this. And Paul would say, shh, you've got Jesus. You've got Jesus. But the second thing he's going to say is, listen, before you think, forget anything else, remember Ephesus, dear Ephesus, remember who you are in Christ. Remember who you are in Christ. One of the reasons that the story of Cinderella, the story of Sleeping Beauty, the story of Man in the Iron Mask, the reason why they are so powerful and gripping is because the main character in the story is royalty and doesn't know it. And all through the story, they consort with, they're under the authority of people who are less than, people who are uncouth. They end up paying, they're paying this their entire life debt to these people that are below them, and we ache for them, and we go, oh, sleeping beauty, when are you going to wake up and realize that you're really Princess Aurora? I had two daughters. When's the man in the iron mask going to realize that he's the good twin and the other Leonardo DiCaprio is the bad one? And, and part of it is Paul is saying, listen, dear Ephesians, dear Christians, who we are in Christ. Notice the language that you'll see through this. Kevin pointed this out to us all this past week. There's not this you, you, you. Paul says who we are our great inheritance, our God, our fellowship, we, us. And it's this great inclusion. We, we who are in Christ, belong to him. That's super important, especially if you're in the town of Ephesus. So if you're in the town of Ephesus, this is about all you can see right here, and you're looking around you, and everybody's worshiping idols, and everybody's doing something. And he says, listen, do you know who else is a Christian? Me. We. We. There are believers all over the place. You're a part of something bigger. We are God's family, and it's bigger. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. There's rights and privileges with that. I, I have the same analogies that I use all the time, so forgive me when I say this again. But if you ever go up to Blowing Rock to kill one to get some ice cream, and you spend that $14 on that one scoop of ice cream, and your kids are sitting there, and they belong to me. And they finish their ice cream or dump it on the ground. Either one. Yeah, there's $45 down the drain. And they're like, I want some more ice cream. And I'm like, here you go. Why do they get that? Because they belong to me. If Joe's, Joe's kid or, you know, Cindy's kid or Susie's kid walks across the street, like, I want ice cream. I'm like, yeah, my kid, get out of here. Go take out a loan from the bank and get some more. You know, take out a second mortgage, get two. You know, so because we belong to Christ... We get him. But it's not just that we get him, we're in him. We're in him. This is part of this. It's like, so he applies we, and he says we are his, we are adopted, and we are wealthy beyond measure because of God's plan. Because of God's plan, we're chosen. And so, again, now he's saying to them, the identity of any Christian is essential to remember because now your identity is not tied to what you do. Your identity is now tied to Christ. Your identity isn't tied to what you did, what you do now, your family. Greater than that, 
Notice nothing about their families, nothing about their host history, nothing about their culture. None of that shows up here. The only thing that shows up here is the greatest part of your identity is now found in Christ because Christ did the greatest deed and he himself is the greatest. So now he's saying, remember, your identity is found in Christ. And so that breaks it down into about four different ways. Follow along. First, verse three, you belong to Christ. And that means that you are possessed by the most high precious eternal lord so act like it there are times that you know our kids were doing something and we would have to take them aside and we would be like those people may do that but we're coming as we don't do that and he says you belong to royalty act like it live like it You're, there's not an arrogance but there are things that are beneath you sinful things vile things don't have anything to do with them. Paul's going to say the same thing to Timothy in a little while. He says, just like a good soldier doesn't get involved in civilian affairs, similar to you, you don't belong to that world. You belong to Christ. It's below you. You belong to royalty. Act like it. You are possessed by the king of the universe. The second thing is in verse 6. He says, you belong to the Father now because of the cross of Jesus Christ. It was God's idea. It was the Father's idea. Isaiah chapter 53 tells us to have his son crucified so that he could have us, so that he could possess us. And so you've got to remember that you now belong to God the Father. He's not someone just scary and far away and the one with all the lightning bolts. It was his idea to give his son. And if you ever want to know how radically loved you are, and I say this for the millionth time, and so I'll say it for the millionth and first time, I love a lot of people a whole lot, and I would give my life to them, and I have two daughters, and I wouldn't give either of them for anyone. Parents, turn around and look at your children. Which one of those would you give even for someone that you love? Now imagine which one of those you would give for someone you hate or that hates you. That's radical love. You've been bought with a price. And so we say this all the time. You're struck between this incredible tension. I'm so messed up and vile in my sin that it took the death of Christ to pay for me, but I'm so valued God gave his son so that he could have me. Remember that. You were bought now so that you belong to the Father. Thirdly, verse 11, now that you belong to Christ, Christ now kind of belongs to you. You are in Christ and so in Christ, and we go back to verse one, verse 3, you have access to all love, all wisdom, all understanding. We talked about this just this past week. You are going to run out of love on your own. But when you are in Christ, you are tied into the source of all love forever. It's yours. You are going to run out of your own wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Well, if you're not leaning on yourself, you better be leaning on who? The Lord. It's all yours now because of in Christ. And then finally, verses 13 and 14, you're now a vessel of God. That's who your identity is. You are a vessel of God himself. He lives in you now through the Holy Spirit. And if you think about what the Ephesians would equate that with, they're looking around every day passing the temple of Artemis going, oh my gosh. All we got is this little kind of synagogue or all we got is we meet at Jeff's house every once in a while and they got this. And he says, forget all that. That, that, that big building houses an idol that doesn't do anything. You now are the dwelling place of the Lord God Almighty. You're there. Remember the true God lives in you. You're a vessel for him. Dear Christians, dear Ephesians, remember who you are in Christ. And then finally... Dear Ephesus, remember that God defines purpose and he has a plan. God defines purpose, dear Christians, and he has a plan. If we start with verse 9 and you kind of go through, you can read it in your bulletin. Paul talks about the slow unraveling of the revealing of God's plan and his purpose. His plan and his purpose, and here it is, is at the right time to bring us to himself for the purpose of belonging to him and to exist for him to bring him glory. Now, before you get all bent out of shape and go, the purpose of my existence is not to bring God glory. It's bigger than that. Hold on there, egomaniacs. Listen, if I took you today and we got in a jet and flew out and we popped out at the Grand Canyon and you had never seen the Grand Canyon before and I bring you to the edge of the Grand Canyon, if you don't go, oh, Something is wrong with you. 
Something's wrong with you if you don't give glory, if you're not amazed, if you're not in wonder. Something's wrong with you if you don't give glory to a big giant hole in the ground. Something's wrong with us if we don't go, my purpose in life is to exist for God and to give the rest of my days to honor him and glorify him. And you go to yourself, well, well, God's got angels to do that. They're way cooler than me. Share something with you, and this is John Piper's, he's a pastor. Basically, the, the, the chief purpose of people is to enjoy God and glorify him forever. God is most glorified when you're most satisfied in him. The best thing for you is to give your life glorifying God. That's the best life you will have if you exist to glorify God and honor him in everything you do. And the reason why that is so important is because God lays out his plan and his purpose. Notice he says later on, and his purpose was, so he's telling you about purpose, so that those of us who accepted him first, and he's talking about the Jews who have now become Christians, can then now go tell others so that they can also come and glorify him as well. And this is a simple truth if you take the, this to its logical conclusion. Every sin and thing that is out of whack in this world is because it's being used against its God-given purpose. I'm going to say that one more time. Every sin, everything that is out of whack in this world is out of whack because people are doing it against the purpose that God created it for. So if you take that personally, if I am not glorifying God in everything I do, I'm going against God's purpose. There have been so many times as a youth pastor, I've watched things be used for not their purpose. Most of them are by middle school boys in bed later on at night. Some of the best are plastic spoons. What's the purpose of a plastic spoon? Okay, we're, we're elementary now. Middle school boys don't get this. But also, have you ever noticed if you take a plastic spoon and bend it back and then hold it really close to someone's face while they're sleeping? It produces a circle-shaped welt on their face. You wake up with some kids that look like they have honeycomb on their face. That's why. You have about six kids all at one time like, let's get around Johnny. One, two, three, stop. And everything that is painful is because it is being used against the purpose that it was given. We are going to come into a cataclysmic clash with this when it comes especially to sexuality because it's all being used for not the purpose that God created it for. Relationships are all broken because they were not following the purpose that God created them for. Lives not used for the purpose that God created them for. Remember, the purpose that you were created for is to exist for God and to live out your days to belong to Him. And so there's this really incredible good news. God is good and He's the giver of every blessing. Remember of who He is. He's not a God that you earn favor from. He's a God that is giving you the fountain. Remember who you are in him. He's not out there somewhere. You belong to him. The God of the universe wants you. Act like it. You're royalty. You are wealthy in Christ. And then finally, God's got a plan and his purpose. Either you're in it or you're against it. Get with it. And so next week, he's going to do these incredible parts where he's going to say salvation is not, it's not a gift for the good things we've done. For God can always look at us, Ephesians chapter 2 later on, he's going to say, and point to us and say, we are his masterpiece. And so as we think about that, and all the things that you think are masterpieces in this world, go home and look in the mirror because in Christ, you are the masterpiece of his grace and mercy. Because he loved you so much, he gave his son for you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much for being such a generous, incredible God, Lord God. Every gift in the heavenly realms is ours because you've given us the source who is your son, Jesus Christ. Lord God, we so often just rail against your purpose and rail against your plan, and we want it to be about ourselves. But Lord God, remind us that we are a part of the plan, and you are the one that gets glory. We exist for you to bring you glory and honor. And the best life we will live is a life that we surrender to you to give you ultimate glory honor and to say and live under the authority of the lord of lords and the king of kings lord jesus where we are so weak remind us we're not carrying this cross by ourselves and we're not walking this road alone but let us lean on you live in you remember that you dwell in us and not shut out your holy spirit or work against him but submit to him holy spirit work in our lives perk us up 
show us the ways that we can serve you and glorify you that we have glossed over because we've been too busy glorifying ourselves. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for one last song. Thank you for giving us the fountain when we were thirsty. 
Lord, we just ask that, that you help us to share this. Lord, we have been given abundantly more than we ever deserve, and we are so grateful for your amazing grace. Lord, please walk with us this week and help us to humble ourselves before you. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. So great to see you all. Don't forget, 6 o'clock in here on Wednesday night. 6 to 7 will be done promptly at 7 o'clock so you can get back and watch Jeopardy. Um, and uh, we love you guys. And uh, don't forget to sign in. If you didn't sign in, we would love to send you uh, Amway coupons and things like that. So uh, we love you so much. Take care. We love you.